Well, Tim, it's a delight to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of hosting many conversations about the microbiome, about gut health over the years, including the good Dr. B, Will Bolsowitz, friend of the podcast, who's sitting right over there right now, who accompanied you. Um, but today is a particular honor uh, because as Dr. B insisted I make clear, uh, you truly are the uh, world's leading authority in this field at the cutting edge of all this fascinating emerging science uh, that's creating a new way of learning about how our bodies work, how they operate um, in the world, and it's very exciting. So not only are you somebody who's innovating new research, uh, you are also pioneering this this fascinating field that I want to learn more about that we're calling citizen science, which we're going to get into. But I think the best place to begin is just to understand what got you interested in this field, kind of the origin story behind this and kind of defining our terms uh, with respect to you know what we're talking about when we're talking about gut health and the microbiome. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Big fan of the podcast, um, so very excited. And my journey's been a bit of a long one, so I... We got time. Plenty of time, okay, so, because um, I'm old, so that that's what makes, makes one's career longer. Um, I started life as a, a, a doctor, went to medical school, and got interested in epidemiology, which is a study of populations, mm -hmm. Uh, but there was no real jobs in that, so I trained as a rheumatologist, uh, studying bones and joints, and uh, made my way up training in that in, in London, in, in medical schools. And on the way, I did a master's in epidemiology. So I was still interested in that side of why diseases happen in populations, this sort of detective in me that wanted to find out why things happen. And I, when I did my... Um, three years uh, research and my thesis in in that whole area and it was only really after in about uh, 30 years ago that I um, I changed tack from purely rheumatology and I started what's called the, the Twins UK project which mm -hmm. was setting up uh, this twin volunteer system across the UK which now has 15,000 twins in it and has been running now for 30 years. So that was the largest of its kind in the world where we were intensively looking at these twins as they were getting older and looking at a whole range of disease and obviously started with bones and joints, which at the time no one knew you know, much about. And the whole idea of the twin study was this nature v nurture debate. And it was really, a really cool time to be doing that because many of the diseases we thought were purely due to aging, for example, uh, ended up having a big genetic component. And many things that we thought were genetic ended up not being particularly mm. genetic. So we found that you know, back pain was three times more genetic than breast cancer. Interesting, and also to interject here, uh, you know, the the state of science with respect to what we understood about genetics in 1992 is very different than it is today. Yeah, it's hard to believe how much our opinions have changed, and how you know the scientists and, and doctors of the time have had these fixed views about everything was degenerative. It was just everything was wear and tear, mm -hmm. and your body just wore out. And that was a common thing for anything to do with aging. And the idea that there were these big differences between people really wasn't really considered. So it, it was really quite exciting to be able to write these pivotal papers to disprove a lot of you know, clinical nonsense that had been talked about and, and why some diseases were given more priority than others because they were more exciting, they were sexy diseases, others were sort of dull, aging diseases. Mm -hmm. So that was the time we were living. And it was also just as the sort of genetic revolution was starting, so we were starting at gene markers, et cetera. But um, it, it took the first 10 years was really convincing people that there was a genetic component to common diseases. At that, up to that point, 
really only been the rare ones that people had focused on or the sort of exciting ones. So that was a cool time and I, and I came out of my little field of you know, osteoporosis and arthritis and back pain into all the other common chronic disease of aging. And that uh, led us to publish all kinds of fascinating work and made me realize that I, if you had a model that worked, you might as well study all the interesting stuff you can, not be stuck mm -hmm. in, a, in a specialty like most of my colleagues mm -hmm. remain. So from what I understand, I mean, obviously, when you're studying twins, it's fascinating to see a difference in outcomes between two different people that share uh, the same genetic makeup and then trying to figure out like why those, what's driving those, the, that differential, right? Um, what aspect of their nurturing it, or their environment is, you know, compelling one to, you know, become ill and the other one to remain healthy um, but was there some sort of epiphany along the way that triggered this fascination that led you into the microbiome or you know how did that kind of evolve out of you know studying these pairs over so many years well I think I, I eventually got out of my system that everything was genetic so mm -hmm. um, I was telling everyone everything's genetic it turns out that 50 percent is the of ever you name any disease 50 percent roughly is genetic and that got a bit dull because i and it's so not got, a very satisfying no it answer wasn't, it wasn't and it was useful because we you know then went on to find genes but as it turned out they weren't that useful either other than maybe for long-term drug targets and things but for me i started looking more closely at why identical twins who were basic genetic clones and lived the first 18 years of their life completely together ended up often dying of different diseases so the aging process was different there was no real genetic base of longevity it was very small one would die of cancer the other one wouldn't uh, one would get autoimmune disease the other one wouldn't one would be depressed one wouldn't so i was suddenly intrigued why we were seeing this when you know all the previous stuff was showing it was quite this seemed to be genetic, and yet the identical twins, which is this perfect model of these, it's like you know all of us have this the shadow person that can be doing in a, living in a different environment to us. Uh, what happens to them? It's like you all own a little controlled right. study, and so I was fascinated by this, and I was I was then determined to try and look and see what were those factors was it gene mutations that were different between them turned out that wasn't the case i looked at something called epigenetics which is where you can switch genes on and off with chemical mm -hmm. signals did that for a few years only small differences that couldn't really explain these mm. big effects and it was then it was about um yeah 2000 about just over you know 11 years ago that i came across the microbiome and said let's test this in twins and that was really epiphany because I found that identical twins had very different microbes. And it was the first time I'd, in, you know, 20 odd years of studying them that I'd found something really different in identical twins. And suddenly I said, wow, that's, that's kind of, that is really cool because why should they be different? And yet, if they are different, that could explain why we, we all get different diseases slightly what we thought was randomly mm. because of this whole new organ in our bodies that is behaving very differently in all of us and essentially producing lots of different chemicals. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a, an aha moment both for realizing you know, this, what we thought was this randomness of disease but importantly also changed um, my perception about f how food works as well and why, the, why, in a way, the whole of nutrition advice had been so muddled and, and confused and seemingly with poor science because we'd assumed everyone behaves the same. Once that food goes into you, you know, it's going to behave the same way in everybody. And right. suddenly, knowing that even in identical twins, they only share maybe a quarter of their microbes means that in response to the same food, they're all going to respond very differently. So that was the... The theoretical moment when I said, aha, this could be really interesting. I'm going to spend you know, the next at least decade working on this rather than all these other areas which I could work on to try and 
get to the bottom of it because I think it can be much bigger than just looking at a few microbes. Right. So it is quite a watershed moment or a paradigm shift to realize or, or, or to kind of reflect upon this conventional perspective, which is our genetic makeup is what differentiates us and it becomes this predictor of a variety of things. But in reality, the genetic differences, like we're much more genetically similar than we are different, right? And that's a very, you know, set number of variables. It's still incredibly complex, but it feels very simplistic in comparison to the diversity of the microbiome and understanding that maybe a better way to look at it uh, is through the differences in, in, you know, these trillions of microbes that are dramatically different from one individual to the next, irrespective of similarities in their genetic makeup, like, and using that as a lens and then trying to, to sort of wend that or tie that to certain outcomes as a predictor seems like an impossible not to untie because of the infinite number of variables involved. Yeah, it's, it's sort of mind boggling the complexity of it, but I think it's, it, it's becoming clear that yes, there are lots of different strains and microbes and you know, trillions of them, but the thing that do, does bind them in common is they are essentially mini pharmacies. They are taking the food as their sort of consumables and pumping out all kinds of chemicals that are unique to us and our, and our, and our system mm -hmm. and in completely in different amounts. And so there is a certain amount of redundancy in these microbes, but the difference, and I think that the key difference is not so much the microbe, but their, the products they make, the chemicals. And that's, that's the essential... Uh, for me, the big difference is understanding food and nutrition, not as macronutrients or these rather old-fashioned ways of looking at it, but in, 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 a, in chemicals, mm -hmm. that we are converting one set of chemicals as food by our microbes into these other chemicals which have massive effects on our immune system, our brains, and our, our bodies and our health. And I think as complex as the microbiome is, it can be simplified by understanding those, those chemicals and this whole science of metabolomics, which is the study of studying these metabolites. Mm. So I don't think it's an impossible uh, scenario at all. And luckily, because of the genetic revolution, we have the tools now to measure our microbiome incredibly accurately and actually uncover you know, 75, 80 percent of the of the microbes that are in there, which is pretty, you know, we wow. wouldn't have believed that. Possible yeah, 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 that's unbelievable. Ten years ago, and the cost has come down from five thousand dollars a sample, you know, to less than a hundred dollars a mm -hmm. sample in in you know in, in ten years. So, it's it's been an incredible journey, and you know, we're just really scraping the surface of what we know about these things, but they have huge potential. Um, in all kinds of areas, not just in nutrition, but in sure. pharmacy and uh, fighting disease and, and everything else because of this, all these incredible chemicals they're producing all the time that we co-evolved with. So before we even go any further, it would probably be good to just define what you mean when you say the microbiome. Like what are we talking about specifically? In general terms, the microbiome is the term we use for the community of microbes, microorganisms that live in our bodies, and we generally refer to the 99% that live in our lower intestine, our colon. And the microbiome really refers to the genes of those microbes, um, should technically be called the microbiota, mm -hmm. but we just use the most microbiome because I'm not fussy about words, and um, everyone now understands that. So these, there are, some dispute about how many there are, but they're probably, a, they're certainly trillions, maybe a hundred trillion or so, roughly the same numbers of cells in our body. Most of them are, the ones we know about are bacteria, but there are also these other uh, related species called archaea, and there are fungi and uh, yeasts, and there are viruses, five times as many viruses as bacteria that feed off them called phages, which also have a role in health. And there are even parasites that 
virtually all of us have to some extent in our guts and some of which turn out to be beneficial as well. So it's this whole community, a bit like an ecosystem that is living within us and it best considers a virtual organ. Stick them all together, they weigh about two kilograms, same as your brain. And they're basically, as I said, these mini pharmacies pumping out chemicals which send signals all over the body, but particularly to all the immune cells, the majority of which are immune cells are actually lining our gut. And so they interact with those immune cells on a constant basis, signaling whether to uh, you know, be aggressive or be passive and modifying them, tuning them up and down. That helps fight aging, helps fight cancer, sorts out allergies, um, etc cetera, etc cetera. in fact fights infections and they also produce lots of chemicals that might go to our brain um, responsible for serotonins and um, many other pathways in the, in the brain as well so it affects our mood and obviously our metabolism and how we digest food mm -hmm. amongst others and right like so many in, things in, right things but this idea that that our immune system really resides in our gut is kind of a shocking revelation like i always understood that our immune system originates in our bone marrow and you know this yeah. is where we're producing That's you know, all these cells and school. yeah this is what yeah this is <laughs> and 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 why is it that we didn't begin to really even put these pieces together in a methodical way until, I don't know, the early 2000s. Like, it seems like you kind of got into this around 2011, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is all extremely recent because prior to that, conventional wisdom was sort of like, you know, we got to get rid of parasites and all this stuff. This is these, these these are plaguing the human body. And at some point, somebody figured out like actually we're living symbiotically with all of this, and this is crucial to every facet of health. And we're still it feels like in the very early beginning stages of trying to understand the true and vast implications of this incredibly complex system. I think it was medical hubris that says that you know our powerful drugs can get rid of this stuff we're fighting mm -hmm. the west of the world we know that microbes have killed lots of people in history infectious diseases you know were vitally important and we survived them therefore you know we can beat them and antibiotics sterilizing creams um you know keeping people away from dirt uh, this is the way we're going to conquer our sort of mm -hmm. uh, our fears and i think it was a blind spot to realize that the gut health really was important and you know, for so long just regarded that the intestine is a tube to get rid of toxins right and that's its own absorb purpose. nutrients some, and, some people still yeah. believe that right but you uh -huh. know uh, particularly the toxin bit but the um uh, not realizing it had such major implications as a vital organ for us and i think it was you know few people guessed at it and even the, the you know you go back to the days of 100 years ago Metchinkoff and uh, Pasteur talking about yogurt they thought it worked because it deputrified the body you know mm. got rid of these toxins they couldn't still imagine that it was feeding other other microbes inside there so it, I think we just had a blind spot to it some people believe the Indi Indian ancient Indian art you know understood the what the sort of core of the gut to health and so ancient chinese and ancient indian did know but of course they couldn't see these microorganisms uh couldn't grow them and uh this has been part of the problem you know we, right medical science just couldn't see them until genetics came along mm. And so over the course of the 30 years under which the Twins UK research has been ongoing, there's been like a thousand research papers that have come out of this. What are some of the, the revelations that um, have emanated out of looking at twins through this lens? Oh, it's hard to pick highlights. I mean, because there were some revelations at the time, they seem might seem rather dull now. Mm. Like I was saying, you know, back pain is highly genetic. Uh, might not surprise people now to say, you know, but um, um, other ones were, we, one of the first to look at uh, fat distribution was highly genetic. So whether when you put on weight, whether you accumulate it in your belly or your, or your, your bum, mm -hmm. uh, really strongly genetic. And you can see that in families, it's sort of obvious. Um, 
we showed for the first time that cataract wasn't just a, was something you, you inherited as well. Um, we looked at um, early risk factors for melanoma, found that, because um, everyone talks about melanoma, they're always talking about sunshine, which is a really overrated risk factor for melanoma. It's actually highly heritable about whether you have these lots of moles. Mm -hmm. You have light skin and lots of moles, much stronger uh, genetics uh, than anything else. And so you can divide people into those groups. And twin studies helped us with that. And uh, we did a, uh, sort of fun stuff. We found sense of humor wasn't particularly genetic. Um, political views were. Mm -hmm. So your right-wing views or um, your uh, left-wing views have a kind of strong heritable basis. Interesting. As does belief in God have a heritable basis. So there's nearly anything that you can quantify, you can um, study in this way if, it's, if you can quantify it reliably and get the similar answer. So it, it, it allowed us to look at... Um, sexuality as well and uh, we were the first to look at the genetics of female sexuality and uh, so you can study any personality or trait um, in that way as well as things like the microbiome um, epigenetics which you know again has some genetic influences and even things like vitamins so people are always talking about oh my vitamin d level is low well we were the first to show how that was strongly heritable and that there are certain mm. genes. So 50% of the differences between, say, our vitamin D levels are going to be due to differences in our genes. So what's normal for you isn't going to be normal for me. And how does epigenetics play into that? From my understanding, epigenetics basically um, means uh, the potential for genetic expression and also this idea that... Um, that we're, we're kind of storing genetic information passed on from our ancestors that is perhaps latent, but given the right set of circumstances, could be expressed. Like how, you know, that, that seems like a sticky wicket and very complicated to kind of understand. And there's a, there's a certain aspect of it that's, that's sort of mystical in terms of like um, the inheritance of, of like ancestral trauma and things like that. Like how does that play into how you think about this and, and and, and study populations. Well, I wrote a book about this called Identically Different, which nobody read, but it was, mm. I think it was a great book, but, uh, you know, as often the way. And went into a bit of this, and a bit theorizing about it, and it's, it's been called soft inheritance. So it's an inheritance, we think, think it's an evolutionary adaptation that allows, in times of stress or famine or some emotional stress, to just... Um, switch the genes on or off in a way that uh, takes you on a different path mm -hmm. and to some extent. And the general belief is that it takes so long to change your genes normally that you know, your whole family would have been wiped out by that time you'd made that switch. But if this allows you to, I don't know, there's a temperature change, so allows you to switch so you gain more weight or um, just the fact that your family might all be switching their genes so that they end up more different. So they're not all going to be wiped out by the same um, environmental stress mm -hmm. or infective mm -hmm. agent uh, makes some sort of sense. So, but it just lasts for a couple of generations and then fizzles out. So it, when I was looking at it, I did interview lots of identical twins who went through stress, for example. And uh, it was quite remarkable that say, you know, a very major family breakup or something when the teenage twins, one, for example, would uh, responded by overeating and got very obese and the other one had an eating disorder and ended up with anorexia. Mm. So they were acting in response to a stress but very differently probably because the in theory you know the, the genes were were switched and doing something but there was something in our there's something in our evolution that allows us to have these switches mm -hmm. and uh, make you depressed or happy and these things. So I think in response to stress it does make some sense. Um, and there are lots of stories about um, after the war, Dutch hunger famines, um, whole populations having these stresses, which 
uh, for several generations had effect on their mental health or others right. due to these change in genes. So it's a lovely, it's a nice theory, but it, it's been really hard to prove it in humans. Mice, it sort of works quite well, is often the case. Uh -huh. um, and you can change mouse hair color, for example, just by giving them different vitamins and things, switching them epigenetically or giving them alcohol or whatever can't do that in humans so it's got to be so frustrating to see you know amazing kind of dramatic results in my studies and not be able to replicate that in humans i mean that seems to be kind of like the <laughs> recurring theme well, across all areas of science millions of yeah. scientists yeah. Uh, have have, yeah. have been frustrated you know, yeah. and that's, and so that's why i didn't get that nobel prize yeah. you know that's so the, no, humans just don't behave mm -hmm. like mice it's very annoying right and the mice studies are what you know generate a lot of hyperbolic headlines in terms of oh, breakthroughs they still and do it's a lot of consumer yeah. confusion and and they still do and and, yeah. and and it's similar in the microbiome it's not not right. very it's right. not different and there were you know some misleading studies in the early days of the microbiome that just um you know exaggerated the potential effects in in humans so they were you know i think they were accurate but they just you, from mouse studies you can't really get an idea of the scale of the effect in humans. Mm -hmm. You don't know it's trivial or it's really large. And I think that's the other sort of problem about extrapolating. And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not rodents and um, we have very different lives and we eat different things. And uh, so, uh, yeah, more and more, uh, you know, we realize that a lot of these mouse studies were flawed. And of course you can do unlimited number of mouse studies you know, you, you've got labs, well-funded labs, they can afford to mm -hmm. slaughter thousands of mice and they don't necessarily report every experiment they do. Right. And uh, that's the other problem, mm -hmm. which human trials, they take so long to do. You, you know, whether it failed or not, you're going to write it up because it's, yeah. uh, it's important. Yeah.